Welcome to Learning with the Cleveland Orchestra. My name is Rose Breckenridge and I'm lecturer for the Cleveland Orchestra Music Study Groups. And today we're going to be talking about Modest Mazorski's Pictures at an Exhibition, orchestrated by Maurice Ravel. Uh, this magnificent work is closely related to Mazorski's personality and events in his life. Mazorski was actually born in Russia in 1839 of uh, aristocratic wealthy landowners um, and uh, he was prepared for military uh, career and commissioned at age 17 but he began to associate with uh, the uh, musician Balakurev who was the leader of the Mighty Five a group of young uh, wannabe composers Kui, Rimsky-Korsakov, Borodin and eventually also Mazursky whose goal was to promote uh, distinctively Russian music. They espoused a pure Russian art, uh, rejecting symphonies and concertos as being too Western and preferring instead tone poems, songs, and operas, all using Russian stories and Russian folk music. In 1861, Mazorsky resigned his mil uh, military post in order to pursue music as a career in fellowship with the Mighty Five. But that same year, the serfs were freed, and that was disastrous for many landowners. Uh, and so he was forced, uh, since his family were landowners, to take a job as a civil servant clerk and uh, he had to resign himself to just studying music at night. His personality was extremely sensitive to suffering. He believed that art should, and I quote, portray the soul of man in its profundity. He disagreed with the idea that art must be beautiful. Instead, he identified with the common man who was often downtrodden. Like his contemporary, the Russian writer Dostoevsky, Mazorsky tried to express the dark and lonely regions of man's soul and the harsh realities of day-to-day -day life. In his music, Mazorsky used bleak dissonances, unusual chord progressions, irregular rhythmic groups of five or seven or eleven. He preferred roughly hewn structures uh, rather than using the sophisticated forms of Europe. Uh, his contemporaries, especially Rimsky-Korsakov, tried to correct what they saw as mistakes. But now we realize that Mazorsky had a uniquely creative vision that was quite prophetic for its time. Uh, in the late 1860s and into the 1870s, Mazorsky's productivity peaked. He wrote an opera based on the 16th century Russian leader Boris Grudinov, and he used Pushkin's play on the subject and also historical accounts to write his very own libretto. But he really made the common Russian people the actual hero. Around that time, he also wrote pictures on an exhibition and began another opera, uh, Kovanshina, uh, that unfortunately he never finished. Throughout his life, he developed and struggled with alcoholism, uh, and uh, really this peaked uh, around the time that his dear friend uh, and artist, Victor Hartman, died uh, very suddenly at 39 of an aneurysm. And it was after this that uh, Mazorsky's productivity began slowly to decline, uh, and also his health um, until he died in 1881. He unfortunately was unable to overcome his addiction despite his continued and valiant efforts. And after checking himself into a hospital, uh, he still uh, died just a few days after his 42nd uh, birthday. Now, the background of the piece that we're looking at today, Pictures at an Exhibition, uh, is actually related to Victor Hartman's death. Victor Hartman was a rising uh, star artist uh, from St. Petersburg, and many people were devastated by his sudden death. And so uh, the year after, in 1874, uh, they mounted an exhibition of over 400 of Hartman's paintings, watercolors, and architectural designs in order to honor this talented young artist who died much too soon. 
Unfortunately, of those uh, over 400 artworks, only 65 can be found today. And after attending uh, the exhibition, Mazorsky was inspired to honor his departed uh, friend, his dear departed friend, with a suite of 10 piano pieces, uh, each one evoking uh, a particular artwork that had moved him uh, when he uh, attended the exhibition. Unfortunately, of those 10 artworks, only six uh, survive. So what Mazursky was very originally and creatively trying to do was to translate visual art into musical art so that we could see the paintings, if you will, with our ears. Uh, but the score that he composed looks more like a sketch uh, for an orchestration rather than a piece that was idiomatically written for uh, performance on the piano. So even though it was an extremely original concept, uh, the piece was soon forgotten after Mazorsky's premature death at uh, age 42. Uh, but around 1900, the French composer Maurice Ravel, his dates are 1875 to uh, 1937, uh, by the way, he himself was a quite accomplished pianist. He discovered pictures at an exhibition, and he not only learned to play it, uh, but tried to promote the piece. And you may also know that um, several of uh, Ravel's famous uh, orchestral scores, he was a brilliant orchestrator, started out as piano pieces, like his mother Gusui, that he later uh, orchestrated. But he didn't orchestrate Mussorgsky's piano piece until 1922, even though he had discovered it and started promoting it in 1900. So what was the reason? Well, we'll never really know, but perhaps his experiences with death during World War I brought to his mind again uh, Mussorgsky's tribute to his dear departed friend. Uh, in World War I, Ravel actually volunteered to drive a lorry at the front, uh, and uh, during that experience, he witnessed terrible suffering. And at the same time, he was under a great deal of stress because uh, his mother was in uh, failing health, and he was very close to her. And she died in 1917 when he returned from the front, and everything just threw Ravel into a deep depression, uh, during which time he didn't compose. It took him a while to recover, and finally he returned to composing in 1920 with his very famous great masterpiece, La Valse. Uh, then he turned in 1922 to orchestrating uh, Mussorgsky's piano tribute to Hartmann, and Ravel's brilliant orchestration for this piano piece has turned the neglected work into a world-famous composition. Interestingly enough, uh, what Mussorgsky did is he started out uh, this uh, piece with uh, something he called promenade, or walking, or strolling, if you will. And this little uh, melody recurs throughout the piece. At first, it's between uh, the movements, almost like he's uh, putting himself as an observer into uh, the exhibition and strolling between paintings uh, with his promenade music. Uh, now, the melody actually starts uh, with a solo trumpet, uh, quite the promenade is separate. The observer is separate from the artwork, but that's going to change as we'll see. The first artwork that he tries to translate into sound is entitled The Gnome. Uh, this is unfortunately uh, has not survived this or it was lost. Um, and uh, we know from contemporary accounts that it was a nutcracker in the shape of an ugly dwarf. 
And so the music that uh, Mazorsky writes for it is menacing and dark with sudden changes of dynamics and tempo uh, to evoke uh, the uh, evil of this ugly, menacing dwarf. <laughs> After this painting, uh, the promenade appears again, but it's changed. It's as if seeing that painting of the ugly gnome has affected our mood. And so the next appearance here of the promenade, uh, it's like our thoughts are darkened uh, and pushed down into the lower register of the horn uh, because of uh, considering uh, the uh, gnome, the, paint, the uh, nutcracker there. So here's... The next number uh, is entitled The Old Castle. This also is an artwork that's been lost, um, but it uh, depicted a medieval castle uh, with a troubadour singing before it. And uh, what happens in the orchestration, uh, Ravel takes the haunting song that uh, Mussorgsky uh, composed and gives it to an unusual instrument not often included in the orchestra, namely the alto saxophone. But as uh, the old castle music begins, we have an introduction first in the lower woodwinds to set a nostalgic mood. And now the alto saxophone with our haunting melody. of the promenade also shows the impact of looking at that painting because in the observer it's as if he uh, has awakened in his heart a longing uh, for that past grandeur and so the promenade is now fuller uh, immediately after the initial um, sound of the trumpet. is entitled Trilui, uh, Children Quarreling at Play. Uh, and this uh, relates to Hartmann's stay in France. Um, he actually uh, studied in Paris for a while and traveled in France. Um, and while he was in Paris, he visited the Tuileries Gardens and he saw the children darting around and taunting each other as they quarreled. And Mussorgsky picks that up with racing figures and a kind of na 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 falling third idea. And uh, Ravel beautifully orchestrates it with um, racing woodwinds and strings. So here. <laughs> promenade. We've kind of forgotten it. Our Mussorgsky is becoming increasingly engrossed in the paintings and moved directly on to number four, the ox cart. This is a very original uh, mo movement. Um, it is a picture, the original picture unfortunately lost, uh, was of a Polish ox cart 
being ponderously uh, pulled by the heavy footed oxen. And what Mussorgsky does is he gives us a feeling of being in the painting by starting out very quietly uh, and ponderously. Uh, and then as the ox cart and oxen come closer, the music uh, crescendos. So here is the ox cart from afar. First the plodding, and then the tenor tuba. And as I said, the music gradually crescendos as uh, the ox cart approaches. Uh, and, and when it's right next to us, uh, the music is not only loud, uh, but there's a drumming uh, figure that uh, is uh, brilliantly scored by Ravel in the snare drum. So here it comes. <laughs> about the promenade between number three and four, but now it shows up and uh, the observer's mood is lifted quite high. Uh, he's forgotten his troubles and uh, the melody uh, reappears in a much higher, lighter scoring uh, that uh, Ravel uh, gave to the woodwinds. Now, so far, all of the uh, artworks depicted have been lost, but now, from this point on, uh, we have some of them that are surviving. Number five is entitled The Ballet of the Unhatched Chicks, and uh, this is regarding a design that Hartman made uh, for costumes for children that were appearing in a ballet at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, and they were dressed as canaries that were racing in darting around, and also some of the children uh, had to be uh, costumed in a shells uh, because they were unhatched, uh, and it was almost like armor where they were trying to push out and uh, get born, and the music is uh, just so delightfully depicting that. <laughs> The sixth movement is about a rich Jew and a poor Jew, and both of those paintings survive. Uh, Mazursky was very interested in a Jewish liturgical music and actually visited some synagogues, and you will hear uh, the influence of those, um, uh, shall we say, Jewish uh, modes that they use in their liturgical singing showing up in this music. Now, the rich Jew is grand and his music is unison and quite loud. And uh, what um, uh, Ravel does is he scores it for strings. <laughs> So la ti do scale. Uh, now our poor Jew doesn't have the power and might and wealth of the rich Jew, and his music uh, is a, a lonely, muted trumpet uh, with repeating notes uh, as he, if you will, pleads. So here is that. <laughs> Very 
very brilliant and original concept. Number seven is entitled Limoges, the market. Uh, we have lost this artwork, but while Hartman was in France, he traveled to Limoges, the city of Limoges, and made this painting of an open-air market uh, filled with bustling people gossiping and arguing as they bartered over their purchases uh, of food. Uh, and the music uh, definitely is depicting that uh, racing around um, and scored by Ravel for the strings. number eight, the catacombs, is a major movement, a much lengthier than the ones so far, uh, and uh, it is quite dramatically different in mood. It's based on a painting that Hartman made while he was in Paris. Uh, he went with a friend and a guide and descended down uh, into the ancient Roman burial chambers in the bowels underneath the city of Paris. And the painting he made of that experience shows the three of them holding a lantern that very uh, eerily casts light on a pile of skulls. And so uh, the dramatic mood change here uh, is depicted with ominous and slow and heavy music as the figures in the painting visit the graves of uh, the long ago dead. What's really unique about this movement, uh, we haven't heard from the promenade theme for quite a number of movements here. Uh, our observer has kind of forgotten himself as he is watching all the paintings. But what Mazursky does here, which is so creative, he takes the promenade theme and inserts it into the middle of this catacombs movement. Uh, and in the score where he did that, he wrote a Latin phrase, which translated uh, means with the dead in a dead language. And what you could say is really the composer who is the observer is no longer a, an observer. He is inside the painting with Hartman mourning uh, the loss of his dear departed friend. Here's this eerie, transfigured version of the observer's theme, the promenade. yet another very dramatic change of mood for number nine, uh, entitled Baba Yaga's Hut. Uh, and uh, this original artwork was a clock that Hartman made in the form of the hut where the witch Baba Yaga lived. Uh, the clock has been lost, but the design for the clock survives. Now, Baba Yaga is a, a witch of Russian folklore who lures children to their deaths and the wild, loud music depicts how evil she is. Uh, the Great Gate of Kiev, as it's been traditionally pronounced, 
Uh, now we use a more proper Ukrainian uh, pronunciation, Kliyev. Uh, this was uh, related to a historical event. In 1866, uh, the Tsar Alexander II nearly escaped uh, being assassinated uh, and plans were made to celebrate the fact that he wasn't assassinated by building this new gate and uh, architectural designs were requested. It was a contest um, and uh, actually Hartman's design won the contest uh, and that design still survives. Unfortunately, the gate was never built. But what Mazursky does here to sort of culminate it uh, the whole piece and come back full circle to his original goal of seeking to write Russian music, he takes the promenade theme and makes it the main theme of this grand and glorious finale. Uh, he smooths it out at first and glorifies it uh, as, if you will, a vision of uh, the return of great grandeur for his native land. So here is the opening uh, with the promenade theme in its new grandiose and triumphant form. <laughs> This promenade theme that was originally at the beginning separate from all the artworks has now entered into the artworks, not only in the catacombs, but in this final glorious and lengthy uh, movement. Um, it acts kind of like a, a refrain that returns uh, repeatedly throughout uh, the time of the movement, and each time it becomes grander and grander. Uh, so here it is. Uh, with lots of uh, explosive and brilliant uh, counterpoint added. <laughs> it was a new version of the promenade theme. Uh, he actually brings back one of the refrains in a more original format of the first uh, encounter we had with the promenade theme. So here's uh, that. It occurs in the middle. <laughs> the grand and glorious final presentation, uh, just when you think it cannot get more jubilant or more triumphant, indeed it does. <laughs> work. I hope you get to hear the entire thing. My name is Rose Breckenridge.